Moving now to the 20th century, we've got Kenneth Boulding. He was a professor of economics at the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, president of the American Economic Association, and in 1966 he wrote an essay on the economics of the coming spaceship Earth in which he compared the what he called the cowboy economy, which is the idea that the when you think about a cowboy in, let's say, the year 1880 or 1870, uh, riding his horse on the Great Plains, you have this huge, uh, partially unexplored swath of land. It seemed to be limitless, and the resources that could come from it could, uh, could seem to be limitless. And he said the, we have to stop thinking about the Earth as uh, in those kind of terms as being a limitless uh, arena for economic growth and instead change our idea to the notion of a spaceship Earth. This, the Earth is a spaceship and just like in a, in a real spaceship you have very limited resources, you have to recycle a lot, you have to conserve a lot and in the same kind of way um, the Earth, if you see it from outer space, doesn't doesn't get any inputs from anywhere else except for sunlight, and so um, uh, so Boulding suggested that there are limits and that we should reconceive of the notion of what possibilities are from as is right the cowboy economy to spaceship Earth. This was echoed in a more systematic way by uh, Herman Daly whose most uh, important early book was uh, Steady State Economics, written in 1977. Daly suggests, basically goes back to Mill, um, suggesting that it's desirable to have a constant stock of human capital and physical capital, and that economic growth hurts the environment and ultimately isn't good for people either. Now, Daly does make a distinction between growth and development. Growth is an increase in the size of the economy. It's, if you want to use a term, this ecological footprint, the amount of impact it has in the natural world. Development is a change in the quality of what happens in the economy. So think about moving from old computers to new computers, or old smartphones to new smartphones, or the development of smartphones. And uh, Daly says that what what he thinks ought to be limited and what's bad is is growth. But he says that development itself could still con continue. Uh, so the economy can still change in a qualitative way, but it oughtn't to change in the impact it has on the environment. So the size of the economy, which includes the size of the human population, uh, should not continue to get bigger and bigger. Uh, daily, many of Daly's ideas uh, echo ideas from Nicholas Georgescu Rogan. Now, Georgescu Rogan I've mentioned before. Georgescu Rogan taught for many years at Vanderbilt, and Herman Daly was a PhD student at Vanderbilt when Georgescu was teaching. Now, Daly didn't actually write his dissertation under Georgescu, but Daly was still heavily influenced by Georgescu's ideas. Georgescu's magnum opus was The Entropy Law and the Economic Process, written in 1972. Uh, we will be talking about that and what that means, what the title means, what the entropy law means in a future video. Uh, here, uh, let me just say that Georgescu was, in some sense, more pessimistic than Daly, uh, although Georgescu rejected the idea, the idea that he was pessimistic uh, completely. Georgescu insisted that he was just being realistic. Georgescu thought that the only sort of economy that could live forever or live as long as the as long as the earth does is a declining economy the, if you had an economy that was in steady state 
let's say the amount of copper that it used every year would be a constant, well eventually you're going to run out of copper. So he thought that a steady state economy was to, let me use the word optimistic, although again he would say it's unre unrealistic rather than optimistic. And we really needed to shrink the size of the economy. And again, this means the physical size of the economy, uh, measured in terms of the amount of natural resources that it uses and the stock of human population. He said, for example, we needed to move to organic agriculture. And when he wrote about organic agriculture, he meant it in a slightly different way than its modern usage. And its modern usage means that uh, industrial chemicals like pesticides and herbicides aren't used. To Georgescu, that certainly was part of organic agriculture, but organic agriculture, organic agriculture to Georgescu also meant that every single part of agriculture would have to be sustainable. And what that meant is that you couldn't use fossil fuels for things like tractors. So any kind of part of the agricultural operation had to be done in a sustainable way. And so, in terms of the question, what is the optimal size of the human population, he said, well, at a minimum, the population should be no larger than that the, which can be supported by organic agriculture, because any other kind of agriculture, by definition, is not sustainable, and so those larger size of the human population would not be sustainable. So, just to repeat, then, the sustainable human population size is that size that can be supported by quote-unquote organic agriculture, that is agriculture that is done in a completely sustainable way. Uh, these ideas, the ideas of, of Boulding and then Daly and Georgescu Rogan, gave rise to the school of ecological economics. There is a journal of ecological economics. Uh, I've published some papers in that journal. And while it's a little hard to describe the difference between ecological economics and neoclassical economics, because there's a whole lot of overlap, and even that journal publishes quite a bit of stuff that I would say is completely neoclassical, um, the, the notion was that you would reject, that ecological economics would reject ideas like uh, economic growth is good, unlimited economic growth is possible, and uh, and so to what extent ecological economics is different from neoclassical economics is something that, that, that is still being worked out. Um, I should mention about Georgescu, as I said, we'll talk about him more in some future videos. Uh, I um, co-authored a book uh, with the colleague uh, Randy Beard from Auburn University about Georgescu in the late 1990s. Okay, so that's the ecological economics school or the school that gave rise or, or the people that gave rise to the ecological economics school how about the neoclassical economics so so the the, the last three people here uh, are the people whom we think of when we think about a neoclassical environmental and resource economics um, AC Pigou 1920 you know that he's the guy who came up with Peguvian taxes which are pollution taxes and they're an extremely important part of, of the way that neoclassical economists think about environmental economics. We studied a lot about um, pollution taxes before. So that's the environmental economics. How about resource economics? So resource economics, we've got uh, two names here. You've already heard about Harold Hotelling, whose 1931 paper on the economics of exhaustible resources formed the foundation of neoclassical resource economics. There was a predecessor, Lewis Gray, in 1914. Now, Gray actually uh, didn't really take into account the exhaustibility of the resource in the same kind of way that Hotelling did. But one can argue that Gray's theory was actually Gray's theory is actually better than Hotelling's because, as I argued when I was critiquing the Hotelling rule, firms in reality may not obey the Hotelling rule. And if they don't, then actually uh, Gray's theory in 1914, which was a lot less mathematical, may be a more accurate description of the way that natural resource firms actually behave, that exhaustible resource firms actually behave, than Hotelling's. So Gray and Hotelling, we're talking about exhaustible resources. 
the first neoclassical paper on renewable resources is by uh, H. Scott Gordon in 1954. So renewable resources, in particular fisheries economics, is a, a much more modern, got, got its start much later than, than, than these, other, these other kinds of environmental and resource economics. Uh, finally, I just wanted to mention a particularly useful distinction that the book makes between command and control and economic incentive instruments, which is a theme that we talked about a lot when we discussed environmental economics. Um, the book says economic incentives, or economic incentive instruments, require not action, but payments. So command and control requires for instance, you emit less than 10 tons of pollution per year. Uh, a Peruvian pollution tax, this is an economic incentive instrument, doesn't require such an action. It only requires that you make payments. Now, the payments, of course, are based on the action, but the action isn't a required action. You choose the action, everything considered, including the pollution taxes considered, and and then you have to make payments according to that.